Part 1. The Proteus Problem The soldier held tightly to the twisting figure. The weapon he'd killed with many times before remained hanging at his side. He needed this one alive. His hands, burned dark by the sun, ached as he struggled to maintain a firm grasp. After years of fighting an unpopular war, he would do whatever it took to get home. Menelaus, king of Sparta, the fiery brother of Agamemnon and husband of the beauty Helen, was on his journey home following the ten-year-long Trojan War. Shipwrecked on the island of Pharos, Menelaus was desperate when the goddess Idothea told him of her father, the immortal Proteus, the old man of the sea. If Menelaus could defeat him, Proteus would surrender the secrets Menelaus needed to lead his men home to Sparta. Defeating Proteus would be difficult because the god possessed a special power. He was a shapeshifter, a polymorph. So Menelaus and his men, disguised in sealskins, lay in ambush on the beach. As Proteus emerged, salty and frothing from the roiling sea, they sprang into action. First he shifted into a great bearded lion, and then a serpent, a panther, a ramping wild boar, a torrent of water, a tree with soaring branch tops. But the Greeks clung firmly, their normal weapons of little use. With each shift they shifted, with each new challenge they changed, clenching their legs tight around the necks of animals that appeared, or digging their fingers into the wooden limbs of trees, or wrapping their arms around swirling balls of mercurial fire. The old man of the sea was defeated. By adapting, the Greeks found their way home. A True Story 860 miles to the east of Pharos, 3,000 years later. Chapter 1 Sons of Proteus Five muscled silhouettes, midnight blue against the sand-colored sunrise, moved down an otherwise empty street on the outskirts of the El Amel neighborhood in Baghdad. The morning call to prayer had just ricocheted through the urban sprawl and faded into the thick heat. A few blinds opened, then quickly closed. Residents knew when to stay hidden. The door of a small house on the corner swung open, and the men shuffled inside. It was September 30th, 2004, and one of the biggest operations they would ever conduct was about to begin. The building appeared unremarkable. Another ripple in the pixelated waves of tan cinder block that extended to the horizon. But inside, it housed a temporary organizational nerve center that gathered data and disseminated instructions across the city. Maps, photos of targets, and operational checklists covered the walls. Personal gear, Weapons and clothes lay neatly stacked in the corner. Those pulling security watched the street, weapons in hand. The newly arrived warriors greeted the other members of their team, the analytic and intelligence counterparts to their brawn, with bear hugs. They asked about their families, joked about colleagues. They also met three new additions to the team, fresh out of training and recently arrived in Iraq. The young faces betrayed the tangle of confusion and excitement that the older men knew would soon give way to fear. The group strode through the halls of their safe house, brushing past photos of the cheerful family that used to live here. Men in combat attire settled into the plush, mauve couches in what had once been a living room. If any of them saw humor or pathos in the juxtaposition, they did not mention it. They had learned to compartmentalize the emotions of war, to internalize as collateral damage the deaths of bystanders, to accept the savagery of the battlefield as an unavoidable step in pursuit of a brighter future. 